This week on The Record, is Donald Trump qualified to run for president? A skeptical Supreme Court grills Colorado lawyers who want to kick him off the ballot. Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft joins us from the road. The Republican fight for control of the Speaker's gavel spills over into Southern Illinois. Why Matt Gates is coming to town. We sit down in a one-on-one -on -one exclusive with Congressman Mike Bost on the campaign trail. Perhaps no state did more to preserve the Union than Illinois. But was the land of Lincoln truly a free state? The little-known story with a big-name lawyer changed the course of history. We check the record. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. The U.S. Supreme Court heard oral arguments Thursday in a high-stakes case about the 2024 presidential election. The key question, is Donald Trump qualified to appear on the ballot? And if not, who decides? Chief Justice John Roberts appeared highly skeptical about Colorado's underlying claim that it should bar former President Trump from appearing on the primary ballot for violating the 14th Amendment's ban on insurrection. Roberts reasoned that that was a position at war with the whole thrust of the 14th Amendment and its history. The 14th Amendment, adopted, of course, after the Civil War, wasn't designed to grant broader powers to the Confederate states in federal elections, but rather to restrain their rights. Justice Elena Kagan said it would be quite an extraordinary step if, quote, a single state should decide who gets to be the president of the United States. Joining us now on his trip home from the U.S. Supreme Court is Missouri Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft, who made a very similar argument on this program just weeks ago. Thank you for joining us. First of all, just your reaction to the way the oral arguments played out Thursday. I think it went really well. I think you're either going to have a unanimous decision or maybe an 8-1 decision uh, that will say that states should not be making this determination. I think it's a great thing because you know that will become political if they allow states to do that. This way, the people get to decide. I take you to believe very strongly that states, not the federal government, should run their own elections. Generally, I do, but this isn't about running an election. This is about the qualifications to run. And the qualifications for federal office are defined by the U.S. Constitution. And yet, each state sets qualifications in state law. For example, can a felon run for office in Missouri? We, as Missouri, can set laws prohibiting felons to run from state offices. Um, but the term limits decision at the U.S. Supreme Court has held that states cannot add qualifications beyond what's in the, the Constitution for federal office. So should a felon then, by logical extension, it, a felon can run for federal office in Missouri and appear on the ballot in Missouri? As long as an individual meets the federal qualifications, and when it comes to you know Senate and the like, that's in the U.S. Constitution, they are allowed to run. That's why when states try to uh, require that there be term limits on uh, members of Congress, that was thrown out by the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court said states cannot refuse to put people on the ballot or stop them from running mm -hmm. because that's adding a qualification beyond what the U.S. Constitution prescribes. Sure. And I suppose lawyers could quibble over whether or not that was an, a term limit is an arbitrary distinction from a, a conviction, which is something that went through due process and might have a different standard there. But that aside, if a felon can run for federal office and appear on the ballot in Missouri, should a felon be able to vote in Missouri? Missourians have generally decided that if you are a felon and have finished your sentence, you can uh, return to suffrage and be allowed to vote, uh, unless that was uh, you were a felon with regard to certain voting uh, crimes or if you're still serving your sentence. Uh, but the United States Constitution gives states the opportunity to decide whether or not felons are allowed to vote. But is it your position, is it your belief that even if one day Donald Trump is convicted, that he can and should remain on the ballot for federal office in Missouri? I would say that if he were convicted of insurrection by federal courts under the federal definition that is a crime, uh, other than that, I would say he, would, uh, he could still run for president. That is a, a special one. Is that the only charge, insurrection, that you think would disqualify him, or could other criminal charges, other felonies apply? Legally, under the Constitution, under the 14th Amendment, there's an argument to be made that if in federal court he was found guilty of the federal crime of insurrection, the U.S. Congress has said that he's ineligible to run for or to hold the office of president. So that's why I cite that one specifically. The last time you appeared on this program, you made a comparison between former President Trump's actions on and around January 6th and former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's inactions. You said she didn't call the National Guard fast enough. Of course, 
they don't report directly to her. They report to a board, which she and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell at the time appointed people to. And as soon as they heard about uh, calls for them to do that, they they did make those calls. And no, we actually saw not. we saw it all on video. There was there was video from inside uh, Speaker Pelosi's office when it was all happening. So we saw her make that call. There was substantial delay, and that's been uh, founded on documents that Congress has released. But I'm sorry, you had a question. I don't mean to interrupt your question. Uh, sure, I was, I was just going to make the, the question again, the distinction about whether or not President Trump took action and whether you make a distinction between that and a, the perception of delayed action or inaction. The really important thing and, and why I filed that brief with the Supreme Court and why 10 other uh, secretaries of state joined me is because that's not a decision for secretaries of state to be making. Whether or not someone has violated the law, whether or not someone meets those qualifications, that is a judicial determination that should not be made by secretaries of state. It's one thing for me to look at your driver's license, your birth certificate, and know whether you're old enough or not. Mm -hmm. But to make a decision about whether or not you uh, may have committed a crime and what all those elements are, that should go through the judicial system and we're better off when it does. My last question for you. You weren't the only Missouri Republican at the U.S. Supreme Court this week. Also Republican running for Attorney General Will Scharf, who's actually defending former President Trump and lost that fight uh, before a lower court to try and shield him from criminal immunity. How do you grade the candidates running for Attorney General in Missouri right now? Do you like Andrew Bailey or Will Scharf? I think that Missouri is going to be in great shape and that the people of the state will make a great decision both in August and in November. Who's the more skilled lawyer in your view? Well, I think I am, but I'm not quite sure that that was the question. You're not running for that office. Between Andrew Bailey and Will Scharf, who would you pick? Uh, you know, we don't even have people that have filed. I'm happy to, to let this play out and listen to why they think they're better. Uh, I'll make my decision just like uh, I hope every other voter will and participate and make their voice heard. Secretary Ashcroft, thanks for your time. A bipartisan border deal, no more. Reaction from one Illinois senator next. Local cities and school districts in North St. Louis County could soon have some extra resources to try and detect radioactive exposure. Governor Mike Parson wants an extra $225,000 in the state budget to fund that effort. Local advocates traveled to Washington, D.C. again this week, urging lawmakers to compensate victims of that radioactive waste the federal government left behind after World War II. A bipartisan deal promised to beef up border security. Senate Republicans from deep red states initially heralded that plan as the most conservative border security bill in a generation. But it died an unceremonious death before it could advance to the House. The lead suspect of its demise? Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, a former trial attorney, charged one politician in particular. One thing happened that we didn't anticipate. One person in America came out against the proposal. One person said to the Republican senators, sorry, no matter what you agreed to, it's unacceptable. Blame it on me, he said, but we are not going to have a bipartisan agreement on the border. This is unacceptable. That one person is Donald Trump. House Republicans had initially demanded border security in any deal that would fund aid for Ukraine and Israel. A newcomer could shake up the race for Congress in St. Louis. Former Missouri State Legislator Maria Chappelle Nadal announced plans this week that she'll run, challenging Wesley Bell and incumbent Congresswoman Cori Bush. Hey, President Biden will not face criminal charges for mishandling classified documents. That's according to a special counsel report where DOJ prosecutors spelled out the president's apparent memory loss and speculated a jury would possibly give Biden a pass for being forgetful. That same report also said Biden willfully participated in their probe, handling all the documents, handing them over freely, painting there a stark contrast with Donald Trump's alleged behavior in a similar case where he does face charges for obstruction of justice. What's driving GOP infighting? We go to Southern Illinois and sit down with Congressman Mike Boss along the campaign trail next. You might remember when Matt Gates toppled Speaker Kevin McCarthy. His Republican colleagues were furious in an angry outburst. Illinois Congressman Mike Bost even threatened to physically put Gates in his place. Now Gates is Illinois bound, looking to back Darren Bailey in his push to drive Bost out of his seat in a primary. We caught up with Congressman Bost at a campaign event Wednesday night where he urged Republican unity focusing on defeating Democrats. But we started our interview asking him who's responsible for turning the party against itself. To what extent is Donald Trump responsible for that? I don't think I don't think it is Donald Trump. I think it is individuals seeking this social media thing that has become a frenzy ever since our cell phones are so low. He talks about crowd size, talks about ratings, talks about his own popularity. Yep. 
is he responsible for some of that thinking? I do not. I do not think so. I think, I think that many of the people that watch what goes on see that model and want to run after it possible. Why impeach uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, the Department of Homeland okay. Security uh, Secretary? Has he committed a high crime or misdemeanor? He has committed, he has, he has committed lies. He has not carried out the orders that are law. So when you, when you take an oath to uphold the Constitution, and you take an oath to hope, uphold the laws, the laws are very clear in this United States about what is illegal immigration. And he has encouraged illegal immigration. So you think he should resign? I think he should resign. But I do. It, but, impeachment but impeachment is a different it, act. But, but this impeachment, and the reason why I support the impeachment, is very simple. He has followed, he, he has chose not to obey the laws of this nation in a power position that is supposed to obey the laws of the nation. And then he's lied to Congress about it. Could you have voted for the Senate bill that was proposed? Senator James Langford said would. No. Why not? And here's why. Because of the amount of, because we have a bill over there that is good and will do exactly what we need to be done. The Border Patrol agents support it. They say it would be good. I understand the Border Patrol agents support it. I'm telling you I don't. And the reason I don't is, is because it doesn't stop it fast enough. And it also, and it also does not uh, implement to remain in Mexico to the level that we need to make sure and as fast as we need to. It has a provision in there that allows for as many as 5,000 to come across every day. That's where they cap. At that point, there becomes an emergency At, lockdown. As many as 5,000 can come across every day. It, we but it also beefs up the pipelines lockdown. and the channels should, to process those people down. faster, right? We should lock it down. Uh, and, 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 and there should have been negotiations with the House on what we did, and, and that, that wasn't that. Sure, and I only stepped in to interject there because I don't know that it's entirely factually true to say it allows 5,000 people to illegally cross. It also beefs up the processing and the, it, the capturing and the enforcement of all that along the way. It has some things that are mm -hmm. good in it, but H.R. 2 is the best bill, and that's what needs to be well, your, your opponent is trying to attack you on this issue, saying that you have supported in the past amnesty, which is to say, let's provide citizenship to people that have crossed the border illegally. Uh, Again, back to the Ronald Reagan era, there was a time in this country when Republicans viewed immigration as an inspiration of American greatness. Why people would want to come here in the first place was, right. was, was an inspiration, not an insult. Well, let me tell you this. The bills that I have supported are bills that actually allow legal, let me be clear on that, legal immigration of our migrant workers, which I believe my opponent has actually used on his farm. He's hired some of them, yeah. It's cheap I'm, labor. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he has. That being said, it was the farm community that came to us to work on that bill. And Donald Trump signed it into law. And Donald Trump signed it into law. Um, so when, when he comes at you with this attack, how do you respond to it? You're desperately grabbing for any straw. The, the constituents that I serve know good and well, and especially the ones that those bills would affect, the farmers. That's why the farmers have endorsed me unanimously through the Farm Bureau on all 34 counties. Why? Because I look at the issue, I deal with the issue, and I govern conservatively, mm -hmm. and that conservatively means legal allowance of immigrants to work in our farms, our dairies. Um, I, I'm gonna, he's asking to, to represent the Illinois 12th. The Illinois 12th has apple orchards and peach orchards and all of those. Without migrant workers, they don't work. Mm -hmm. So you and, see and legal immigration is a good thing to legal, help. Legal immigration has to be here, but it has to be legal. And, and, to, and to put the farm workers that are coming here legally across the border and doing all the paperwork right and the, com and, and the farmers themselves that actually handle that paperwork and meet all the requirements, it's a shame that they're being drug into the politics of this when he knows good and well what the truth is. My last question for you uh, is, is on uh, an issue closer to the state of Illinois and southern Illinois especially. It's been very important in these last uh, few months. You said a moment ago that uh, Secretary Mayorka should be impeached if he didn't uphold the laws. But your campaign has put out statements saying you would not abide by the uh, yeah. assault weapons ban yeah. that Governor Pritzker signed into law in southern Illinois. Right. Um, let me tell what, what, I, tell what I said. Do, do you own any of the guns on that list? I think, it, I think it's unconstitutional. So you think the courts will still meet it out, but the state police have put the rules in place. And the state police have, well, talk to any state police, county police, local police that I've talked to, and my other statement was, 
they're not going to enforce this. A lot of sheriffs have said that, but do they have an obligation to uphold the law? Didn't they take the same oath that Secretary Mayorkas did? Took, they also took an oath to uphold the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But they, they, they took an oath but to uphold the Constitution. That? A, a judge decides that. They took an oath to uphold the Constitution. This is truly unconstitutional, and I'm not going to put my guns on display, okay? And you ask me which guns I have, and 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 I don't tell people. You know, guns you know why I'm asking that question. I do understand. You, your opponent you're is I, showing his and, arsenal. And, I, and I'm telling you that what I what guns I own, according to my constitutional right, is my constitutional right to keep them to myself and not show them. I figured that might be the answer, but I had to ask. <laughs> okay. Um, so your your position now is that you're waiting to see a court ruling, or that you're going to? I'm not registering my guns. Even if a judge says I'm not the law is guns. constitutional, I'm not registering my guns. I'm, I, I'll, I'll look you right in the eye and tell you I'm not registering my guns. That that is not, and and, and not only that. Let me list, listen to would what the this law, law would does. the law require you to if it let wasn't me, on that list because that's what I'm not clear on. I don't believe that law will ever pass constitutional muster, mm -hmm. and because I have a governor and the people that were the legislators that voted for this chose not to obey the constitution which they took an oath to by bringing a law, a law forward that infringes on my personal rights and my constitutional rights, that's a problem. Remember, and this is vitally important for your listeners to remember, we are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. And the Constitution is what we weigh everything against. You do not have the right to know what I personally own as far as my uh, firearms. Mm -hmm. So if it goes all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where there's a conservative majority, and they find that this law is constitutional, then what? We'll see how it plays out. We'll see how it plays out. Congressman, thanks for your time. Thank you. Our extended interview with Congressman Boss is on KSDK.com. You can also find more of your latest political news by texting the word RECORD to 314-425-5355. We'll be right back. Ten score and 15 years ago, Abe's father brought forth upon this continent a newborn president-to-be conceived in Kentucky and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Yes, tomorrow would be Abraham Lincoln's 215th birthday. The Great Emancipator's February birthday, together with that of Frederick uh, Douglass's, are now the basis for Black History Month. And our history teachers certainly told us an awful lot about our 16th president, so much so that many Americans endearingly call him by his first name, Honest Abe. And for good reason. He was, in this newsman's opinion, the greatest president our nation has ever seen. Thousands of books explain why, movies too. His last name adorns street signs, parks, college campuses, entire cities. A movie in our area, we call a whole state the land of Lincoln. But remember, remember his maxim, all of us were created equal. Should then all of those who shared in his struggle share an equal measure of history's gaze? After all, he had it much easier than most. Much easier than a young man who looked to a lawyer to plead his long shot case for freedom in a St. Clair County court. Yes, in a free state, technically, but we didn't even know his last name. He was the vanguard of this case that basically outlaws slavery in totality for the entire state of Illinois. Um, unfortunately, we don't know a lot about what happened to Pete. Pete lived here in this brick house, the oldest brick house in the land of Lincoln, built by people who labored in slavery before Illinois was ever admitted to the Union. When it was in 1818, the Constitution outlawed slavery going forward, but grandfathered in those already enslaved under a different name. Five on your side, Sidney Stallworth spoke to Brad Wynn, the manager of that Jarrett mansion in Cahokia Heights, where its owners considered Pete part of their property. Laws were created to sidestep the word slave and then call them indentured servants. But the reality of all of this is, you know, we're, we're splitting hairs. We're just playing semantics at this point. A servant for life, how is that any different than an enslaved individual? Enter abolitionist lawyer Lyman Trumbull. He advocated for Pete's freedom first, lost at that juncture, then appealed, won his back wages later, and then would argue those same arguments shaping a legal launch pad that birthed the 13th Amendment ban on slavery. So no, the land of Lincoln was not always a free state, not even while Lincoln himself represented the state as a legislator. In fact, Trumbull had to keep fighting as a U.S. senator years later to roll back laws that limited the liberty of black Americans at the time. As Lincoln put it, or might have put it, it is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. That does it for us this week. We hope you'll join us right back here again at the same time next week. Until then, we're off the record.